Welcome everyone to the eighth uh, Hardware Acceleration Working Group. Um, today with uh, us all, we have uh, Jeff and Eric uh, from Berkeley. They'll be telling us about fantastic work they've been uh, leading on essentially cloud robotics, and we'll uh, listen to that in the second half an hour of the meeting. Uh, as usual, uh, let's kick off uh, the meeting by uh, letting people that's new to the group uh, making some self introductions. So uh, folks, uh, the stage is, is yours. Uh, maybe Jeff and Eric, would you like to, to get started with the intros? Uh, sure, I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley in uh, Ken Goldberg's uh, Auto Lab and in the Rise Labs. And I work, at, I work on automating robotic uh, manipulation as well as uh, systems that make it fast and you know, cloud enabled. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student, and my advisor is uh, John Kuwait Toys. So, my research is different from the robotics. Uh, I'm actually a uh, security enclave and all the like uh, system security background. And uh, I'm a main uh, contributor for Fogbras, uh, which we are going to cover in this talk. All right, thank you guys. Um, anyone else uh, new to the group? I see some new names. Would you like? Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, this is uh, Madhu from uh, Bangalore, India. I'm pursuing currently pursuing masters in embedded systems. So I'm. I mean, I don't know what happening here. So I'm. I'm just joining. Okay, Madhu. Well, thank you for joining, and hopefully you'll enjoy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Hi from Munich, my name is Alex. Uh, I've been the team leader of the TUM Indie Autonomous Challenge team until February this year. And now I'm the CTO of a newly founded startup uh, for autonomous driving from TUM. Awesome to have you, Alex. Welcome. Hi, so I'm Miriam Lisa. I'm a professor at Northeastern University. I've been working in FPJs for a long time and I'm looking at FPJs on robotic platforms. And I think my PhD students are on the call also. <laughs> Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Vicky and I work with Dr. Lisa. Fantastic. So, uh, Miriam, Vicky, uh, very, very nice to have you. Welcome. Hi, I'm um, Dele. So, I'm currently working as an embedded systems engineer interested in um, robotics. I'm also doing a master's by research in the area of machine learning. So I'm quite interested in implementing um, stuff on FPJ. Well, I saw like a publication on um, this robotics um, solutions you guys are working on, and that got me interested in joining this group. Welcome, Dele. Anyone else? No? All right, so uh, let's go. So I'm pasting in the chat uh, for everyone's uh, interest the uh, minutes of this uh, meeting. As usual, uh, all suggestions are uh, welcome, especially filling your names and so on and so forth, which I'm not fast enough to do. So the first agenda item we'll be covering uh, is the Ultra 96 B2 port, uh, and I'll be sharing my screen just right now just for the sake of the discussion. So um, again, um, Starting from old business, we're going to uh, touch quickly on the progress that has been happening around the Ultra 96 B2. As some of you uh, who've been in the group for a while may know, uh, the Hardware Acceleration Working Group is built around an open community wherein contributions are welcome and wherein essentially that's what's going to drive the reference hardware platform. So far, most of the contributions have gone towards this uh, AMD uh, CREA KV260, which made it the uh, reference hardware platform. But we are constantly evaluating and considering other uh, boards so that they get added also as co-official boards. Uh, for that, we have a number of guidelines, uh, which typically get uh, summarized in this uh, ongoing standardization effort for hardware acceleration uh, architecture and conventions. Uh, I'm gonna paste this in the chat as well, for those of you new. Uh, everyone's welcome to review this document uh, and add uh, his or her view uh, to it. In a nutshell, uh, it is an open document and follows the uh, common guidelines of the ROS enhancement proposal. That's what REP stands for. Um, going back to the reference uh, hardware boards, one of such uh, boards that has been going on for quite a while is the uh, Ultra 96 V2. Um, pretty early uh, within the working group, there was, uh, there was a number of folks actually that have shown interest and I've been supporting them on the side to uh, make sure that this gets enabled. 
Pedro Martos has been uh, very active in leading us as a community to get support for the uh, ABNet Ultra 96v2, uh, and it's still an ongoing uh, work. Um, as of last uh, message, I think Pedro managed to uh, get some decent progress and build some of the first examples. Uh, I know that uh, there's been quite a bit of activity on the matrix room uh, of the working group, and you can find all of those details about where the community is interacting within the community readme uh, of the uh, corresponding repo. But nevertheless, uh, my understanding is that this is still an ongoing work. Um, I believe uh, Pedro and Joe and a few others are pushing together also with Robert. Uh, so keep it up. Uh, and uh, as always, I'm, I'm following closely and trying to help whenever I have cycles for it. Um, I checked this a few hours ago and it seemed that Matrix was having some issues. Uh, I'll check afterwards as well. But anyhow, if the room is down, we'll find out uh, another way to establish a, a chatting mechanism for the working group members that want it. Uh, so, uh, so feel free to ping me if that is something that bothers you at this stage. That is regarding the Ultra 96P2 port. Uh, regarding the uh, hardware acceleration workshop for the upcoming ROSCON 2022, that's going to happen in Tokyo uh, in a few months. Uh, um, essentially, that is tracked in here. So last time I informed about the intention to present a workshop. Unfortunately, after reevaluating it, due to a pure lack of resources on my side, I'm going to have to step down on the organization of the uh, workshop for the um, on the hardware acceleration workshop for ROSCON. Uh, nevertheless, this work uh, is already uh, done and there's uh, an interesting prospect. I think what's left is essentially to come up with a description and to invite a number of uh, guest speakers. I'm more than happy to facilitate that list and even to help engage them. The only thing is that I'll be over, uh, overloaded, very overloaded with work. Uh, and frankly speaking, I don't see myself uh, finding the bandwidth to do the proper organization that a uh, formal workshop requires. And just F FYI, uh, from past experiences, workshops require a significant amount of work. Uh, you can expect uh, from 30 to 50 participants on each one of the workshops, and these happen the first day, um, the first day of the conference. It's a three-day conference, so typically the first day is where workshops happen. I definitely encourage everyone, uh, if attending, to to show up in any of the workshops in one, because they happen simultaneously at least. Uh, it really saddens me that uh, we will not be organizing a hardware acceleration workshop, or at least that I will not be uh, behind it, but I'm more than happy to support if anyone uh, has interest to drive it. Uh, just let me know and I'll be more than happy to uh, hand over this to uh, whoever wants to have uh, or wants to do that. Okay, so uh, regarding the robotic processing unit, which is a project uh, that we announced in one of the past meetings, uh, there's been pretty interesting feedback provided by uh, some of you and some others who are not uh, participating in the uh, working group meetings. Special thanks to Theo, Guglielmo, Joe, and a few others uh, in the working group. Uh, there's been, uh, your input has been received and I'm slowly integrating it. Uh, for anyone that deserves, or sorry, desires to provide additional uh, feedback, sorry, one more. Um, you can do so in this link right over here. It's still open uh, and I'll keep it open at least for a bit more um, because feedback uh, still continues coming. Uh, as of right now, uh, I'm still working on integrating all of this feedback and as tracked in this uh, ticket, the next objective is essentially to uh, define the use cases driving the architecture. Uh, and the development. As some of you uh, might remember, uh, just to refresh uh, your mind, or uh, for those of you new, so that you are aware, the objective of the robotic processing unit is not to design a new physical device, uh, but instead uh, we plan to use existing off-the-shelf hardware, uh, acceleration development platforms, and we'll use them to prototype uh, essentially uh, this concept of a robotic processing unit, uh, that performs best on robotic computations, best than alternatives, and, and potentially other existing uh, alternatives out there. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a work in progress, nothing else uh, to report um, on that side. Jumping into uh, progress review and uh, new business, um, I'll start with um, this short uh, write-up, I'll, I'll touch on this later. But I wanted to touch briefly on uh, perception notes, performance, benchmarking, uh, and to, to motivate this uh, in a nutshell, 
Uh, to most of you, it might seem obvious, but to many out there in the robotics community, it's still uh, something uh, to be discovered. The fact that essentially hardware acceleration is critical for edge perception. And most of the fancy uh, robotic behaviors we tend to see out there actually do include robotic perception. This is one of the many, uh, and some of you may know this one. This is Atlas. Uh, Atlas uses exhaustively uh, hardware acceleration to ensure that, uh, that it can perform uh, these movements, this, this dexterity uh, uh, on the go and, and at the edge. Of course, it offloads certain computations, uh, but still it is those uh, capabilities, that hardware acceleration capability at the edge what really empowers many of the uh, fantastic movements we, uh, we actually see. So uh, with that motivation in mind, uh, one of the open questions that I've been receiving uh, so far has been, well, so which is the right accelerator? Should I be using uh, GPUs or FPGAs? Uh, and previous uh, reviews we performed within the working group analyzed this from a ROS2 computational graph perspective. Um, so to build on top of that, uh, this new uh, study that, uh, that I disclosed a while ago, sorry, not this link, uh, but actually this one, uh, essentially builds on top of those graph, com computational graph inspections and looks into particular ROS2 nodes. Uh, in particular, it tries to answer that question and looking specifically at FPGAs and GPUs. Uh, in particular, for the FPGAs, we select uh, the AMD CREA KV260 uh, reference platform. And for GPUs, we use uh, or select for benchmarking purposes the NVIDIA Yetson Nano. Uh, the rationale behind this is because those are the ones I have easily available and also because, uh, frankly speaking, from a CPU-centric uh, perspective, the ROS2 performance is somewhat comparable in those two development platforms. Uh, the AMD's one uh, features, I believe, um, a quad-core A53, whereas the uh, NVIDIA one uh, an A57, a quad-core A57. So, uh, so when testing things uh, ROS2 wise, and again, from a CPU-centric perspective, the performance is similar. So that allows us to get also a decent comparison of, uh, of the actual accelerators themselves. Uh, also, to be a specific, specifically fair, uh, in this case, the benchmarking approach that has been used is the exact same one that we've been using so far in any of the past few meetings. And you can see it described in here in the RUB 2008 that I uh, pasted before in the chat. So you can see here uh, the proposal, the rationale, the reasoning behind it, uh, and how to perform these uh, systematic assessments uh, and benchmarks, per performance benchmarks, uh, by following this methodology. So by following this, um, and more specifically, to be more precise and isolate things to the acceleration kernels, uh, what we are doing in here is actually uh, focusing uh, and discarding part of the uh, compute time. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a bit. Um, from an implementation perspective, uh, some of or actually many of, the, uh, of these nodes are actually available in the acceleration examples or similar packages linked in the working group uh, organization. Uh, but in a nutshell, what they do is they, labor, they leverage sorry, AMD's uh, Vitis vision library and NVIDIA's uh, vision programming interface uh, to put together a number of perception nodes that are compared one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, so uh, this is what I mentioned before about the fact that to be a bit more fair for what concerns comparing uh, kernels, acceleration kernels, what we've done is uh, trying to, again, leave aside the differences uh, between the, uh, the ARM cores uh, we are essentially uh, capturing and discarding uh, both the ROS2 message passing infrastructure and the host device uh, interactions uh, on, on data transfer overheads. This happens both between the CPUs in the AMD solution and between the uh, ones in the uh, NVIDIA solution as well. It's just uh, whether they interact with the FPGA or the GPU. Now, going into the results, um, results show pretty interesting uh, figures and numbers. Um, if we take a common filter such as uh, Harris, for example, uh, we see how uh, we get a 30.27x uh, uh, speed up um, factor, um, rectify and resize were subject to uh, various discussions in the past. And we also analyzed a simple computational graph involving both of them. Uh, there's also a slight um, acceleration factor uh, with uh, resize and a decent one more than seven times uh, with rectify. Then we have more complex uh, algorithms such as uh, the histogram of oriented gradients wherein the difference is significant, very significant. Um, and others wherein essentially uh, we also get interesting speed ups uh, for us to consider. When looking beyond pure uh, runtime uh, and diving deep into actually the power consumed, 
Um, the observation overall and on average is that uh, in general, the FPGA uh, counterparts are um, more power efficient uh, or five times more power efficient. This is a, a rough average. There's, uh, there's, there are some nodes where in the actual uh, performance per watt uh, difference was significantly higher than five times and there were others where uh, it wasn't that high. Um, beyond these results uh, shown and as we have repeatedly been uh, mentioning, at least this is my uh, viewpoint, uh, further improving ROS2 uh, definitely is going to require mixing uh, these uh, compute substrates in the right way, in the right manner, and certainly not always CPUs or FPGAs would be the right combination, but GPUs would have a very strong component in certain computations within robotic pipelines. Uh, and definitely this is the path we are exploring in here, and this is the path we will continue exploring. Part of the work I intend to uh, engage with in the coming few months is the fact that through this robotic processing unit, we'll have a chance and a benchmark uh, baseline wherein we will be able to uh, build more complex computational graphs uh, and wherein we will not only be using uh, FPGAs but GPUs and this will essentially lead us to essentially craft together uh, base platforms that are going to use some of the uh, reference hardware platforms that are were compared today uh, in combination which I think is pretty interesting and certainly pretty cool. So that is what concerns uh, these ROS2 perception nodes performance uh, benchmarking uh, there's one more item uh, about new business, but before moving forward, I just wanted to uh, open up the mic in case someone has questions or comments or anything is welcome. None? All right, so then um, let me dive into the last item that I prepared for today's uh, discussion and updates regarding uh, new business. Uh, and this is something that I'm uh, terribly excited about, and it connects terribly fine also with the upcoming uh, guest talk we'll have from Jeff and Eric. Uh, it is something that I've been working on uh, for, I think, quite a few months already, right, Jeff and Eric? Um, and it, it does connect with this uh, initial vision we had when we uh, triggered the working group about ensuring that acceleration can be leveraged not only to the uh, edge, uh, or in workstations, but also all the way into the cloud. So together with the Berkeley folks, uh, I've been cooperating to make sure that uh, not only uh, cloud uh, becomes easier with ROS2, uh, but also that hardware acceleration is a first-class participant of these cloud extensions that will very soon be announced as part of, of essentially upcoming ROS2 releases. So um, in a nutshell, uh, the, the overall um, extensions were described in a past uh, blog post uh, that I shared in here, and the changes are as of today already integrated into the uh, REP 2008. What I'm going to do is, let me see if I have it locally in here. No, I don't. All right, so we'll just look it up uh, in here. Um, so in a nutshell, the extensions have added a fourth pillar, as you can see, and some of you may remember the, the overall architecture proposed uh, was based on three pillars, extensions to the ROS2 build system, extensions to the ROS2 meta build tools to ensure that everything can be orchestrated directly uh, by following the ROS2 development flow. Extensions, or better than extensions, uh, the addition of a new firmware layer, which allowed to switch from accelerators by simply uh, just enabling one flag, uh, while keeping, keeping, sorry, the same development flow. And finally, uh, with the latest extension or addition, uh, we have now a fourth pillar, the cloud pillar, which once again dives into um, ensuring that cloud capabilities, uh, specifically hardware acceleration in the cloud, uh, can be pushed uh, in the same way we build accelerators for edge devices. Uh, technically, from a technical perspective, uh, the only Thing that changes is the fact that instead of targeting an embedded uh, edge target, we need to pass a flag that targets a particular uh, instance in the cloud. Uh, so it's instance specific and also cloud specific in a way, but regardless, the complexity is uh, abstracted away uh, from the ROS2 developer. And the only thing you need to do is pass the right flag for the right instance. Uh, automatically, all of the build system will get configured for you. It will generate the corresponding artifacts automatically. So many people jumping in. Sorry, guys. Uh, and um, and yeah, once those artifacts are generated for the uh, cloud, um, you can directly just push them uh, into your corresponding um, cloud instances. And that, again, is something that uh, Jeff and uh, Eric will tell you more about. Um, 
again, just to highlight it, uh, some of the notes I, I took in here, um, this effort of the cloud extensions to the hardware acceleration architecture aims to bridge the gap and simplify the use of hardware acceleration also in the cloud. Uh, we believe there's lots of potential in here, and, and certainly uh, as uh, ROS2 computational graphs get spread across uh, essentially uh, edge, workstation, and cloud, uh, this is going to be a, a big need. Um, again, uh, the way we are pursuing this uh, or approaching this is uh, in a completely uh, vendor agnostic and hardware agnostic manner. So regardless of whether you are working with GPUs or FPGAs, uh, you'll be able to do the same in the cloud, uh, provided, of course, your cloud service provider offers those uh, instances, but that is your choice. Um, and last but not least, uh, this effort also uh, seeks to achieve a unified way to leverage hardware acceleration uh, so that people just need to learn things once. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, entry barriers uh, that I've been encountering and that people have been telling me that they've been encountering. And this is also based, by the way, on the survey we conducted uh, earlier um, this year. Uh, and FYI, the, the data is being processed as of now. And once it gets finalized, it will be edited by a design team and then it will be published. I think that it shouldn't take too long for that to, uh, to be finalized. But yeah, this is in a nutshell, uh, the exciting pieces uh, that I brought for you all today. Um, very excited, frankly speaking, about the cloud extensions uh, and hopefully the talk today uh, from Jeff and Eric uh, will further enlighten this topic and bring your interest uh, as well. Um, we'll have a QA and a at the end of the session, but since we have uh, four more minutes until I hand it to uh, Jeff, are there any uh, questions right now? None. All right, so uh, then um, it is a huge pleasure of mine to uh, introduce and hand it to uh, Jeff and to Eric, uh, who are essentially working, as I said, in Berkeley, uh, connected to the Autolab, um, uh, and together they will tell us about FOCROS2, an adaptive and extensible platform for cloud and FOC robotics using ROS2, which uh, I'm very optimistic about is hopefully going to get accepted within uh, IROS, but we'll see. <laughs> great, thanks for the intro and thanks for having us here. Uh, this is great. So I do want to preface this talk by saying you guys are getting the first view, uh, first access to the rough cut presentation of this work. Um, we're definitely open to feedback, criticisms, ideas, and so forth. I would invite you to interrupt me at any time during the talk. If, uh, if I feel like I'm, we're running low on time, I'll try to politely, which I'm not necessarily capable of, uh, actually I yeah, am, but politely uh, try to move us forward. Um, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, feel free to just interrupt at any time with questions and um, you know, we'll try to open it up at the end um, for uh, discussion. Um, one of the reasons why I say that is that now that I'm presenting, I can't actually see um, see any of you or the chat, so I can't see any questions. So if someone has something and you don't want to talk about it in chat, maybe Victor can um, you know raise the question. Um, so can you see my screen? Anyone? We can. Yes. Okay. We can. And you see the presentation, not the presenter notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> we see the presentation, yeah. Can you can you try passing, maybe, just to see if, if it moves? Yeah, yeah works. All right, awesome. awesome. So yeah, so I want to tell you about cloud robotics and this project we're calling FogRoss2. Um, and um, I, I had a little trouble trying to gauge uh, the, you know, the right level of content for this audience. Uh, I do understand that you guys know uh, Ross pretty well, but I wasn't sure about the cloud side. So I'm going to start off with, uh, you know, what is the cloud? Probably a pretty basic question. Um, well, the cloud, um, you know, maybe as simply as I can put it, is on-demand pay-per-use access to network computing resources and the software and databases that run on them. Um, so one of the main selling points for it is really that cloud computing frees user from having to manage and purchase hardware and from running the software. Um, what I think is of particular interest to this group is that sort of computing resources part of it, where we have multi-core CPUs as sort of like the mainstay, but now we're starting to see more and more FPGAs, GPUs, video transcoding, fast neural network inferencing, tensor processing units, and, and probably even more than forgetting, that you can just get access to by essentially providing a credit card um, and you know, paying per use of the, of the hardware. And now I'm not really an expert on like the hardware that they provide, like the FPGAs, um, but from what I hear from people who are experts, the FPGAs that they provide are big. Um, 
Now, another part that's really kind of exciting about the cloud is that you get essentially unbounded access to uh, these. I mean, really, your bounds are going to be on your budget. Um, but if you need 100 FPGAs, you can get 100 FPGAs and then use them for an hour and then stop using them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this leads to cloud robotics. Um, and so we can easily define what like a cloud is now. And um, you could probably try to define robot. That's actually kind of a complex question. Um, but if you think about the possible number of cloud configurations, it's actually kind of daunting. And you multiply that by the number of uh, robots and tasks that they can perform, that just becomes even bigger number. So I think one of the ideas that I was thinking through is like, how can we get uh, an idea of what cloud robotics mean uh, by just going through sort of a, uh, and what the future is, by just going through a brief and, and borrowed history of robotics in the cloud. So I found this great visual on the internet. Um, it's a brief timeline of robotics and AI. And it sort of starts around 1921, when many people agree that the check write, a check writer coined the term robot. And over time, we started to see this exponential growth in robotics. Starting around like 1961, we have the GM Ultimate Robot, followed by a series of successors, including the Shaky Robot, which uh, somewhat infamously has this cut scene where it's like the robot looks at a scene, and then they cut, and they say the robot does some computation. It's really two weeks of computation. And then they cut back, and the robot does it. Uh, and so then we get to the 1990s and beyond. We start to see trends such as in 2000, we have three quarters of a million industrial robots. We, in 2005, we had the self-driving car challenge. And 2012, we saw a breakthrough. I thought it was a breakthrough in the Baxter robot, an incredibly low cost uh, robot for its time. And now we're starting to see drones, robots increasingly automating logistics, virtual assistants, and more. And if we look at the cloud side of thing, uh, so it wasn't really until like the 1960s that uh, professor suggesting, started it by suggesting that um, uh, computing could be sold as a utility. So that's a really interesting way of thinking about the cloud, that the cloud is essentially a utility of computing. And the history is somewhat mundane for a little while. Um, you get ARPANET, uh, network operating systems, internet are forming over the next couple of decades. And the main history really starts in 2000 with the launch of AWS. And from then, you can start to see this explosion of growth. It's, as its utility and popularity has grown, the cloud is becoming increasingly capable. Uh, for example, AWS added GPU instances, and people started proposing using edge computing to overcome latency concerns. And new forms of comp computing started to come out, like serverless computing, where you, you pay for function usage. And I, I'll get a little bit to that later. Um, and as the cloud started gaining more and more popularity and utility, hardware accelerators such as TPUs and FPGAs were added. And so that, I think my key takeaway from that brief history is that both robots and clouds are experiencing expo exponential growth. And we're at what I would think is still very an early part in the process. Any exponential part, you're always in the early part of the process. Um, so I'm sure you have other key, key takeaways. Feel free to interrupt with them. I, I think it would make for a great discussion, too. Um, but at this point, I want to compare robots and the cloud and see how they might complement each other and why I'm excited about this and why I'm actually excited about hearing like the hardware acceleration uh, side and perspective of this. So just looking at how we compare these or contrast these, the robot has a huge upfront cost. It's usually, you know, let's say $100,000. It's all capital expenditure. You just pay for it upfront, and then you got a robot that maybe will last, you know, 10 plus years. On the other hand, the cloud gives you on-demand pricing, so you get the computing as you need it and what computing you need. And it seems to be trending along with Moore's law. So as you wait, you know, a few years, you get access to more and more computing capabilities, and you know, the previous sort of high-end computing becomes cheaper. Um, robots are often designed up front to uh, consider power, weight, and mobility requirements, and that often limits their computing capability, whereas the limits on the cloud is really the cost limit. So you have a lot of computing capabilities, but it's just how much you're willing to spend on it. On the robot side, and I th think this is where you know, some of the, what Victor was mentioning earlier, that hard real-time safety critical aspect is really important to address on the robot. Just the latency to the cloud is probably an insurmountable barrier at this point in time maybe not in the future. But if you've got something that's absolutely safety critical, you've got to run on the robot. Whereas if you want to get more out of the robot, you want to get the robot to do more things per unit of wall clock time, you can look to the cloud for more performance and parallelism. You can look at to bring new capabilities that maybe aren't safety critical to the robot. And maybe finally in that last row, the, the fun idea I was thinking about is that algorithms and robots are outpacing the capabilities of robots. You've got a 10-year-old robot. You cannot run a you know, modern neural network-based uh, program on it efficiently. And meanwhile, the cloud is, the available computing is always outpacing algorithms. Like even the largest language models, which is something like half a billion 
um, weights and it is still under the capabilities of what the cloud can provide. So now that I've talked about cloud and robots, what is cloud robotics then? Kind of revisiting that. Well, the, the definition is open, but here's a few ideas. So with big data that we can get in the cloud, we can start to think about doing collective learning. With on-demand computing, we can start to take on more tasks faster, better, um, more efficiently. We can start to think about human-robot interaction using these large language models. You know, take your Amazon Alexa as a, an example. Sorry if I triggered it with a keyword. Um, and you know, fleet management. You can have network management of large distributed fleets of robots. And at present, we're sort of increasingly dependent on the cloud and remote presence, like, like right now on the Zoom call, or I'm sorry, a Google Meet call. Um, and this has really been uh, leading, this has been something that's also led to an increased adoption of the cloud. You know, the ongoing pandemic has really placed a huge demand on society. Um, and this includes uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing demands for e-commerce and logistics. And these are places where robots are just nascently available. Um, it's also created huge demand for more computing, networks, data, uh, things that are increasingly only available through the cloud. Um, we've also seen an explosion of Internet of Things, things with low computing capabilities that often need the cloud to gain any capabilities. And you could put you know, low-end robots in there as well. And so one of the main concerns that we're often thinking about is uh, the cloud has network latency. So how do you use it on a robot? Uh, but one of the things that's kind of exciting is that new technologies in 5G, and up, like 5G, and the upcoming 6G, this concern sort of diminishes and enables new approaches that we may not have considered in the past. Um, so for example, consider self-driving cars. By most definitions, these are safety critical robots. A timing failure would lead to harm or death. Uh, but when self-driving cars run into problems that their AI cannot handle, remote operators can take them over and drive them remotely and safely. So the future of cloud robotics is uh, looking bright and I would argue necessary. Um, to get to a future where robots are increasingly helpful in everyday life, we can start thinking about the nature of robots in the cloud and how we can get the, the best performance benefit out of the cloud. Can we start looking at the edge or fog layers to get more capabilities that reduce latency? And can we take, for example, like the aging population as the population ages and we have fewer and fewer active people relative to retired adults, we need to start looking for new ways to, to meet labor demands. Or maybe we could just start thinking about things like, wouldn't it be great if you left the house in the morning and it was a mess and a robot took care of everything for you while you're gone and it cleaned up everything for you? And these are things that we're looking at the cloud to enable. And we're starting to see these capabilities. We have uh, compute uh, where the compute demand is really high. We can start leveraging the, the cloud. Um, so I'm going to skip through the details of this, but this is some of the research that we did in uh, uh, the auto lab at Berkeley, where we looked at how we could distribute the, the processing of uh, that decluttering task that I showed you, where we could do a lot of learning using the computing power of the cloud, we could use edge networks to make adaptation and uh, inferencing much faster in uh, lower latency. And this is a part that I'm really going to skip. Um, and I'm going to get to another example that's actually kind of a running example that we use in the, the fog rust part, which I'm building up to. But say you have a robot that wants to get around a room. Well, one of the really effective ways to do this is called sampling-based motion planning. And you can see from this animation, I'll just restart it, that it works by just randomly sampling configurations in space and connecting them into a tree and sort of improving as you sample more. And there's a really effective way of speeding this up is just parallelize the process, sample more uh, uh, samples concurrently and build the tree faster. And I'm going to skip this part, but basically I'm going to say that we have been able to overcome some scalability limits in some prior research and are able to do processing like this. So you have a one core machine you might get a motion plan that looks like this. You put four cores on it, you get a plan that looks like this. You put 32 cores on it, and you get a, what looks to be a near optimal plan in the same amount of wall clock computing, just by putting more computing, more parallelism on it. We've even extended this to very high dimensional problem plan, uh, uh, planning, and you put it on the cloud. So here's the, the key fun uh, part of that project, I think, from the cloud side. We ran this. Uh, multi-core sampling-based motion planner on a 72-core motion, uh, on a 72-core cloud machine. And you can see it's using all of the cores um, simultaneously to compute this motion planning problem. And if you look a little more closely, you can see that in 
uh, 90 seconds of wall clock time, we got one hour and 45 minutes of CPU time. So we're, we're able to dramatically increase this. Like if we can get these types of improvements using the cloud, we can say, take something that took a minute to compute on the robot and do it under a second. And so even at that point, we're no longer worried about that latency uh, effect. Um, but there's other things that we can look at using the cloud for, um, which is sort of an, another exciting direction that we're thinking about, where um, different computing problems for robots have different computing requirements. So let's say we go back to that decluttering problem, and let's say a robot's like decluttering your, your lab space, your office space, your school, wherever it is, and it's got to navigate between rooms. Well, navigation is a pretty easy problem for a robot to solve on board most of the time. But when you get to a manipulation problem where it's got to move that multi-degree you know, multi of freedom arm, it becomes a, a higher difficulty problem. The, the difficulty of motion planning grows exponentially with the degrees of freedom. So you start to get these high CPU time problems. And maybe looking at it another way, if you've got a robot that has this sort of CPU usage over time, it might solve a simple problem and then not be using computing while it's moving you know, switches to a complex problem, and then, the, again, the robot's moving and not computing anything. And you might get to a very, very complicated process, problem where you've got to, you know, declutter this desk. And this is sort of a, a joke from our lab because this is an actual uh, desk in uh, the lab. Um, and he said, the owner of the desk was like, this is perfectly organized. And I said, what about that can? <laughs> so now the, the point I'm getting at here is that if you have that always on high-end computer, whether it's locally or in the cloud, using it for that short, you know, bursty, intensive computing problem is inefficient, um, whether it's CPU, FPGA, or, or whatnot. You're going to be wasting uh, money and resources on you know, hardware that you're not using. So the cloud has offered something called serverless computing. And the idea with serverless computing is that you get a single function computation without a, direct, without a dedicated server. And you're built in 100 millisecond increments. So if you use a second of computing, you get a build for a second of computing. Now, it has a bunch of limits. I'm going to skip through all of them, except for sort of one of the key details where it's got very limited processing capability. It's only got two hardware threads. There's, as far as I know, there's no GPU or FPGA offering yet, but I suspect there will be. Um, and one of the things that we looked at is, well, could you well, if one multi-core Lambda, you know, it's probably going to be too slow. It's probably going to be the, about the same computing as you have on a robot. If that's not sufficient or that's too slow to run your planning problem, maybe we could have multiple Lambdas running concurrently and compute a problem, you know, quicker as a result. So I'm going to skip the details of the algorithm. Uh, this is sort of the more robotic side of the conversation. Uh, but suffice it to say, if we can share very little information between these concurrently running processes, and scale from 10 to 100 and even 1,000 concurrently sampling Lambda processes um, to speed up our motion planning, just kind of demonstrating the on-demand scalability of the cloud. And so we applied them to very standard off-the-shelf uh, benchmarking problems. And here you can see sort of the, the difference that you can get uh, between 1, 4, 16, and 100 Lambdas. Just imagine the 1 Lambda being what the robot can compute by itself. And in the same amount of wall clock time, we just get a vast amount of improvement if we use 100 lambdas. And this trend increases, uh, shows across the board with all these different problems. But putting it back onto that motivating example of the robot decluttering a desk, if you have the same amount of wall clock computing time, you do one lambda in parallel, or just the robot itself, 10 lambdas in parallel, or 100 lambdas in parallel, using this uh, process that I sort of skipped through quickly, you can see that the 100 lambdas gives us a faster solution to our target grasp point for that robot than we got with the 10 lambdas. And in that same amount of wall clock time, the robot could not compute a single solution. So we can go from not computing a solution to computing a very good solution by just adding literally a few pennies to the computation using the cloud, using these methods. And that sort of exciting point goes back to, I think, that point where you have this $100,000 robot and you want it to, say, declutter the hull, but it can't do it all in one night. So you need to get two robots using you know, onboard computing. But if you can speed up efficiency enough, you can say, well, using the cloud, spending an extra buck fifty a night, we can get the robot to declutter the whole place at once uh, in one go. So that sort of led to this thought process, well, Using cloud robot cloud for robots isn't easy. Um, you know, you've got sort of the the cloud side of people that don't 
really dabble in robotics, and the robotics side of people that won't dabble in cloud. Um, so we decided to see if we could create a platform to really streamline the deployment of uh, processing uh, robot parts in the cloud. And ROS, and particularly ROS2, became a really good place to start with that. Maybe the best way to do this or talk about this is just go through an example. So here we have this robot application. It's got four nodes in it. It's got a sensor node, a control node. It's got a grass planner node that really benefits from a GPU. It's using a neural network to look at an image to compute where it should grasp an object stably. And it's got a motion planner node, which is like one of those ones that I showed you before, which really benefits from a lot of CPUs. But the robot itself only has two cores and no GPU. So what do we do? Well, with FogRoss, we say, let's look at this launch script, and let's just change the launch script. We're going to say, we want one of these nodes to run on one of the cloud instances. We're going to say, at the top here, we want to use the US1 uh, region. That's the one closest to Berkeley. We want to use this particular you know, magic string of G4DN, which translates into a machine with the GPU. I'll get to that in a second. And then we just say, on the, the bottom part, we want that robot node, that grass planner node, to run on that machine that we just specified. And after we do that and we launch it, FogRoss takes care of the rest. It moves those nodes into the cloud. It sets up all the machinery that you need in the cloud. It sets up secure communication between the, the robot node uh, on the robot and the robot nodes on the cloud, and essentially makes it all happen. And from the coding perspective, there's not been a line of chain code change. This is literally no change to any code other than that launch script that I showed you. So diving into a little more detail, um, I'm not sure if my mouse is visible. Can you see my mouse, Victor? No? Any, anyone? No, anyone? I can't. Sorry. No, no I can't. Darn. Uh, well, let's, uh, I'll ask your eyes to look for the, the one, which I was trying to point out. Um, so the first thing it does is, when you launch FogRoss, it will set up a virtual machine in the cloud. Then, two, it will uh, deploy all the ROS dependencies um, and the application workspace dependencies into that virtual machine. Then, three, it will set up the virtual private networking, the VPN, between the robot and the cloud. And then, number four, it will copy over the workspace, in particular, the nodes that you want to run on the cloud. Then five, it will set up the uh, DDS networking between the robot and the cloud, essentially telling the robot that it needs to communicate over the VPN and the cloud the, that it needs to communicate over the VPN. Then six, it will set up any Dockers that are needed. This is uh, a part that I'm kind of skipping over, but we also support Dockers. And then seven and eight, it will launch the nodes um, in cloud and robot. And so that, that's what FogRoss does for you. And again, now you could potentially do this all yourself. Um, that's how we prototyped it. But FogRoss, it was really just those changes of lines of code. Uh, in, I'm sorry, just the changes in the configuration script, and it launches in the cloud. So we, we ran it on a few examples. We took a SLAM, a simultaneous localization and mapping uh, process, and ran it on a 32-core CPU in the cloud. And we got half the latency just by running in the cloud. We took a grass planner, uh, a very popular one that we use in the lab called DexNet, which requires a GPU from a robot that didn't have a GPU. Um, and we got a 12x speed up, including the network round trip time. And then with that multi-core motion planner, we went from a two-core robot to a 96-core cloud computer, and we got a 28x speed up. So now I'm going to go through a walkthrough. Um, of how you might go about using FogRoss. Um, and again, feel free to jump in at any time. But the first part of the process would be to say, figure out what instance type you want to use. So I'm just going to the Amazon website uh, to see what instance types they have available. Here's the general instances. Maybe more interesting um, it would be to start looking at the compute optimized ones, where you can see that they offer up to like 96 cores or vCPUs, where the GPU accelerated one where you can get access to a machine with eight NVIDIA A100 Tensor Core GPUs, or an FPGA uh, instance, which has, uh, I think, up to eight Xilinx Vertex UltraScale VU9P FPGAs. Um, and then once you figure out which of those machines best suits your application, you might say, well, how much do they cost? This is kind of an important question. Because uh, now that you no longer have to you know, get a machine, you do still have to pay for it hourly. Like, you don't have to get the physical machine, but you still have to pay for it hourly. So you don't want to be paying too much. 
so the first thing you might do is say, look at which region you want to go to. So here I'm showing that we're looking at the US West region. And then you might figure out, well, uh, is that the right region? So one way to effectively figure this out is just to try to ping all the, the different data centers that you could have access to. So I'd actually encourage you at this point, open up another browser tab and go to cloudping.info and hit the HTTP ping button. And you'll see the round trip latency to all the different data servers, all the different data centers um, that Amazon provides. So this one I ran just last night. I'm on the East Coast right now. And you can see that I'm getting 41 milliseconds to US East 1, 58 to US East 2. So I can kind of choose between those two. When I was in uh, Berkeley just a, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was getting 15 milliseconds to US West 1. So once you've figured out that instance type, you then go to select, well, we want the FPGA in US, you know, whatever region you are, or EU, whatever region you are, or so forth. And you might select, of the options available, the ones that best suits your need. Um, or the lowest cost that will satisfy what you're trying to accomplish. So here we might, for example, choose this FPGA-based instance with a $3.3 per hour uh, cost. Next thing you might do, if you don't, haven't done this already, I'm not going to walk through this, this. There's plenty of tutorials. It's just sign up for it. And essentially, this involves verifying your email address and providing a credit card. Now we get to the actual talker example. So the talker example is pulled straight out of the tutorials. We have. Uh, a slight modification here. Uh, I wish my mouse worked, but I would be pointing out that we're getting the host name and IP address of both the talker and the listener. The talker is the upper right. And you can see what it's doing is on that timer callback, which it's called every second. Um, it's going to be sending a message that says, hello world from host name, uh, host IP, and then the counter. And on the subscriber on the lower left, you can see that it's going to say, I am, and then print out its host name and IP. And it's going to say, I heard the message that it heard. So now we're just going to walk through this screencast, and hopefully it works, of walking through the demo. And so first thing we do in this demo, as unfortunately I, I popped it a little early, is we're just going to look at that launch script um, that's, part of, that's included as part of the Fargross uh, demos. And in particular, we just want to look at you know, how does this launch group look? There's nothing magical here. This is just straight out of the examples again. You can see it has a launch description. It creates a talker and listener nodes and so forth, and just adds them and runs them. So now we're going to build, as you have to do, um, ignore all these errors. This is the early cut of the, you know, a couple of weeks ago from where this video is taken from. Um, we don't see those anymore in the latest release. And then we're going to launch it. And right now, we're not using any of the Fogrest capabilities. We're just launching the Talker uh, example um, that showed you. And you can see that it's going to say, hello from 127.0.1.1 to, um, well, that went a little quick, but it was from localhost to localhost. It, the robot was communicating um, with itself. So now we're going to go in and modify that um, launch process. So we're going to say we're going to use Fogrest launch description. Um, we're going to need a machine type. So in this case, we're going to use uh, an AWS instance. And uh, we're going to say we want region, uh, in this case, we're going to say US West 1. So that was the region that I just uh, pointed to before. And instance type, we're going to select something, um, just a basic instance called T2 Medium. This has no hardware acceleration. We're really just demoing the capabilities. And then we're going to provide an image, AMI image type. And this is something that really you just copy from the documents. You wouldn't have to type it out like I'm doing here. Um, and then once you've done that, you then go in and you say, well, I want the listener node to be a cloud node. And I want it to run on that machine. So again, th these are the only changes we're making. We're not changing any code. We're just changing the launch. And of course, we've got to add our import. So we do an import from Frogross. Uh, we import AWS and Cloud Node, and then we save, and then we uh, run it. So well, then we build, and I'm going to skip the build part and just see if I can get to the running. Um, and now I'm not going to try to hide any details from you. I, I've sped up this part of the video because the launch process uh, does take a little bit of time. But you can see what it's doing is it's allocated the machine. It's installing the dependencies that you need for ROS or updating them. Um, it's uh, you know going through all the different processes you need to get a cloud instance 
essentially ready to go. And I'm uh, going to finally build the workspace that it moved to the cloud. Uh, oh, there's a Docker image. It set up the, IP, the VPN. We skipped over that. And now it's started the launch process. And so now I'm going to go to the, the uh, real-time you know, speed video. And you can see that you've got the talker and listener going from different IPs to talk to each other. And I've not changed, again, any line of code. The robot, uh, one of the nodes is on the cloud, and the other node is on the robot, and they're talking to each other just fine. So now I'm pressing Control C and doing a command line uh, interface to see all the different instances that I have running. I have just that one that I showed, and now I'm going to terminate the instance so I don't get charged for it anymore. And that's it for the demo. So next steps are we are working actively and diligently and very hard to get it into ROS2 Humble. Um, we welcome contributors. We welcome early access testers. You know, anyone who's willing not to say, hey, this doesn't work. It's horrible. Anyone who's willing to say, hey, it doesn't work. Here's, a, here's something that doesn't work. Please fix it. Or here's an idea for a fix. We also have an IROS22 uh, workshop on cloud robotics um, that we're going to be going to, and hopefully to Roscon as well. And then further down the line, uh, this is where I, you know, I'm realizing we're short on time, but these would be really great discussions I'd love to have with the Hardware Acceleration Working Group. Um, you know, where are the integration points that we could think about? Some of our own planning is more command line interface tooling, monitoring, maybe looking at better performance and instance reuse, or increasing the capabilities to make use of the cloud, such as using multi-agent or that serverless computing paradigm that I went through. And with that, I'm going to try to wrap it up with some time to maybe talk a little bit and uh, put up a URL. And feel free to reach out to us um, at the email addresses listed below and say thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was, that was a fantastic presentation. Thanks. All right, folks. So I hope you are as shocked uh, as, as I am. Uh, I must admit that I knew a few of these things, <laughs> but still getting, getting Jeff uh, on stage is, is, is certainly very impressive. So um, it's time for the Q&A. Uh, questions, comments, pointers? Don't be shy. Can we randomly call on people? Yeah, okay. I have a question. I mean, in terms of total cost of ownership, uh, did you analyze? I mean, what's the what's basically the the, the amount of money that uh, a typical application will spend, let's say, in a year? That is a really really good question. I don't know if I can answer it though because I think it's pretty application specific. Um, there are definitely break even points, right? You could imagine that. Everything can run on the hardware on the robot, and you can spend a little extra time and uh, not use the cloud at all. That's definitely a possibility. Um, the other extreme is that you you know can use one robot instead of fifteen because the cloud speeds it up so much. So I, I don't have a really good answer for that. I'm sort of leaving it open to uh, like the application implementers. Uh, but that's one of the things that we're thinking about as far as like the tooling of making it sort of easy to sort of. Uh, to make that computation, you know, like figure out for your application what is the, the break even point. And the other question I have is basically on the communication. You, you touched up on that, and then you, you, we were saying 5G, 6G. I mean, uh, did you analyze the environment in which this communication could be a little bit difficult? I'm not saying, I mean, a uh, house environment, but a little bit more harsh environment, like, you know, uh, places in which 5G doesn't reach uh, properly. I mean, uh, do you expect a, a sort of, uh, you know, downgrade of uh, performance? How how you articulate this functionality? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. I, the problem is I don't, again, it's, such, it's a good question, but I don't have a good answer for it. I think um, there are definite places where if the network communication is bad, you're not going to be able to make use of the, the cloud. The other interesting thing, point that I, I think is a, a really good one to start thinking about as well, and Victor mentioned this earlier, is the, the power requirements of it. Like, um, there is a power requirement to using the network, um, and does that power requirement uh, overcome the the benefit um, that you get from using the cloud? So, I think I'm not trying to basically what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to sell this as like an end all solution for everything. I'm just saying that this is a new exciting way to accelerate some robotics domains and hopefully many robotics domains where um, 
you you can and i acknowledge that there's some places where it's just it doesn't make economic sense thank you all right I just one uh, 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 yeah sorry uh, so i was just saying so as of now the demo uh, you said was like uh, it was uh, on the cpu right so what if we have to accelerate on like fpgas or gpus right so what else would you change in the code there well, so one of those one of those demos I, I realized I went through very fast was using a GPU. That was the the middle one, the grass planner, and I went from doing inferencing on the robot CPU to using inferencing on the GPU in the cloud. And we could do that because we're using like uh, PyTorch under the hood. So PyTorch, you know, we'll use whatever hardware within limits, and it went, you know, twelve x improvement, including which we were excited about the round trip latency. So we add the latency round trip, compute on the GPU very fast, come back with a solution 12x faster than doing it all locally on the robot without network. So I was thinking like for the FPGA, you would have to have some like uh, the HLS code or something hardware accelerated code for that so, the, so that yeah, so that you can run it on the instances as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm happy to be talking to you guys. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, folks, there, there seems to be some uh, some excitement about questions. Uh, so, if people have questions, please raise your hands. Uh, Alex had had uh, raised it before, Jazz, but you were just too fast. <laughs> I'm Alex, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. no worries. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, I was just thinking. So that also works probably beyond multiple cloud machines. If you launch like multiple instances and like it set up a holistic network and not a one-on-one -on -one communication, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So a, one, one, <laughs> <laughs> one interesting question that was posed in the chat, um, and apologies, I'm not sure I can pronounce uh, why your name properly, uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, he or she is asking uh, if it would be possible uh, to bring these capabilities to a local server. Okay. So Harry, <laughs> thank you. That is, uh, that's a great question. Um, it is on our roadmap. We have a plan for how to do that, but we're not doing it yet. Um, and we definitely have use cases. It, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's on our future list, it's just where to prioritize it. Um, and so, you know, obviously if we get a lot of people saying, hey, we want to do it, um, you know, to nearby computers, that would definitely influence our, our uh, thought process on prioritizing. Yeah, I agree with that. And what I would point out, Harry, would be that, I mean, both Jeff, Eric, and I know the architecture of Focros pretty well. We've been working on that for the past few months. And there's no technical, uh, I would say, hurdle uh, that stops you from jumping in and contributing. I, an extension that actually does exactly that. Uh, from, a, from a technical perspective, you'll just need to identify where exactly we're engaging with the cloud and point towards uh, a local server. Uh, so, so the actual amount of code contributions, I would say, is, is pretty reasonable. So uh, if you're excited about that, uh, why don't you open up a ticket, an issue, uh, and maybe start asking for pointers. And maybe that is something that you can uh, get out of the way from the Berkeley's uh, folks team. Uh, contributions, as, as Jeff said, I think are super welcome. So, so yeah, I would encourage you to do it. More questions or comments. Maybe um, I can make a quick one and we're out of time, which shows the level of excitement, uh, Jeff, that your talk uh, raised. Um, one of the things that I would point out uh, for those of you more experienced with ROS uh, is that uh, I personally believe that this work opens up uh, the door for a new actually uh, communication paradigm. For those of you following or that have been following ROS2 uh, interactions for the last few years, you would probably recognize that there's typically two, three ways uh, that people often consider. The first one is intra-process uh, communication, wherein nodes are within, within the same SOC are, uh, and within the same process. Then there is uh, inter-process communications, and we've seen in the community a bunch of contributions to uh, make that more efficient with ICRX and other projects related to that. And that is, in a nutshell, uh, essentially nodes within the same SOC, uh, but in different processes. Then we have the intra-network interactions uh, when you have various SOCs connected uh, with a local network typically. And I personally think this intra-network next boundary or cloud, let's just call it cloud, is what uh, this work really, really empowers. Uh, I think Jeff was quite on spot by showing first early during his presentation that the latencies actually are not that much. And especially if you compare to some of the alternatives we have right now in, in ROS2, uh, depending on the computations and the computational graph, uh, the door that gets opened is, is significant. So super, super exciting about where this can, can bring us. And I'm sure, as Jeff said, that 
uh, we're just limited by the use case and, and hopefully many, many, many computations will be pushed to the cloud. And hardware accelerated. <laughs> <laughs> that is the next boundary uh, we're going to be working out. I'm, I'm happy to report on that, that uh, I'm hoping to find some time to contribute uh, a few additions. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, there's a working prototype that beyond essentially uh, leveraging a CPU in the cloud, also leverages cloud instances that do use hardware acceleration. And this flow that I described wherein you build the accelerators directly in the same way you build it today for edge targets uh, within the architecture we've created over the last few years, uh, works identically the same for the cloud. So, um, so yeah, this is coming. Uh, and I guess uh, we just need to uh, be tuned to it and eventually it'll, it'll come out. Cool. Well, thanks so much for having me. I realize we're way over time now. Um, I would like to say, <laughs> feel free to reach out to Eric or me. We, um, I put my email address in the meeting notes. Um, I'm not sure that's a good idea or not for like public posting, but definitely happy to answer your questions. And uh, the the Fogros link should be somewhere as well. Thank you very much once again, Jeff and Eric. Thanks everyone, and uh, we'll see each other next month. Uh, just as an FYI. Uh, Humble is releasing in a few weeks. Uh, so those of you tuned to the community, uh, start testing things out, start reporting about issues, and, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for, for more good stuff coming up. Have a good one, guys. Ciao, ciao. Take care. Thank you, guys. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.